Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this month's AFPHM webinar. Today we have Professor Martin Kirk presenting on improving surveillance to identify and control foodborne disease. I'll now hand it over to Professor Kirk. Thanks very much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really, really. It's really great to be able to come present here today. I'm going to be talking on something I've worked on for a long time. I originally wanted to be a a water scientist because I was a surfer and never wanted to move away from the beach. And my first job was in the Victorian Health Department about 30 years ago, dealing with swimming pools, cooling towers and drinking water. So as I went along, I became interested in the link between water and health and did the MAE program here at the ANU. Um, and after that, I ended up moving into foodborne disease because there's not a lot of waterborne disease in Australia with such high quality water supplies. Before I start, I'd just like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land, the Ngunnawal people here and wherever you're meeting there and their elders past, present and future. So today we're going to be talking about um, foodborne disease surveillance. Just let me get the slides. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why foodborne diseases are important. I'm going to talk about surveillance of foodborne diseases and how we conduct that here in Australia, how we investigate outbreaks, and, and hopefully this will be a little different from what you've heard previously. I understand that you've had presentations on outbreak investigation as part of preparations for upcoming exams, but this will be slightly different. And then just finish up with a few reflections on foodborne disease before we have a question section at the end. So food is a, a part of our everybody's life. It's a it's a, um, a, a universal right, and um, access to safe and secure food is necessary for life. Um, uh, certainly, one of the things that has interested me about foodborne disease over the years is the various different food vehicles that cause disease. This isn't one of them. This is a fantastic meal in um, Vietnam. Uh, in, it turned into an amazing fish in the Mekong turned into rice paper rolls. But the, the various different ways that foodborne disease manifests is amazing. And the other thing that about foodborne disease is it has a huge detective element. So it is one area where analytical epidemiology is often applied to understand causes of infection and prevent further disease. So there are many ways we can assess burden of different diseases and for, for for infectious diseases one of the most important things to consider is what is the policy objective so why would we want to assess the burden of a disease does it have a vaccine is there some other measure of preventability about that so we can look at burden from a health perspective and that might um, we may be able to do that through measures like incidence, so how many, what, how many cases of disease in a given time period and um, population, how many hospitalisations, which might be a marker of severity, and how many deaths, which is the mortality that disease causes. We might look at a societal, from a societal perspective, so outbreaks and the disruption they cause and the impact, the impact on businesses and communities. Or we can look at costs, which might incorporate direct and indirect costs, and is a is a very good way of attracting the attention of policymakers, particularly in, in an economic framework. And then we can also use summary metrics such as disability adjusted life years or quality adjusted life years, which have benefits, but they also have downsides too. Many of these summary metrics don't really take into account how amenable a disease is to prevention. So, for instance, something like waterborne diseases, um, the dallies due to waterborne diseases in Australia is very low, and that is largely because of very effective prevention through treatment of water supplies and effective sanitation. We've done work in Australia to assess the burden of foodborne disease. We've done it twice in 2000 and 2010. And in our most recent assessment in 2010, we estimated there were 4.1 million cases of foodborne illness in Australia from a range of different microbiological and 
and chemical causes. These, this included 5,100 cases of non-gastrointestinal illness, things like meningitis and hepatitis, and 36,000 cases of chronic sequelae, which include things like irritable bowel syndrome, reactive arthritis, or Guillain-Barre syndrome. Foodborne illness resulted in 35,000 hospitalizations, 95 deaths, and we know from public health surveillance that these, there are around about 150 outbreaks of foodborne illness investigated through health departments each year, which have a confirmed cause of, of contaminated food. I've also been involved in a WHO initiative several years ago that completed its work in 2015 that estimated the global burden of a foodborne illness. And this was, it had the acronym of FERG, which was Foodborne, Epi, foodborne Disease Epidemiology Reference Group. And it was an expert group established in 2009. It had five working groups and the aims were to estimate the burden of foodborne illnesses. And um, as you can imagine, there are many countries around the world where data are lacking and had to be modelled. We also had to estimate the proportion of disease, which is foodborne, because for many diseases with a faecal oral transmission route, you have multiple potential means of transmission. So it could be contaminated food, water. And so we used a Delphi study, a global Delphi study of experts to estimate what proportion of different pathogens were foodborne. And we developed some tools to study foodborne burden in countries. And we reported in 2015 for circa 2010. So our estimates for um, 31 hazards uh, we developed disease outcome trees, including sequelae for these different um, outcomes. And you can see that there was only three chemicals included in there. And that does not mean there's only three chemicals that cause foodborne illness. There are over 200 different diseases thought to be transmitted or caused by contaminated food. And these include a range of different bacteria, viruses, parasites, and chemicals. Um, we also included estimates for high income countries for four hazards, including four bacterial toxins and peanut allergens. And used imputation and expert knowledge to fill data gaps. And as I mentioned before, we used expert elicitation on transmission mode where that was important. So if you think about disability adjusted life years, I mentioned them before and I hope everyone is familiar with them, but they are essentially a summary metric that adds up the years of life lost, it years of life lost or YLLs and years of life lived with a disability. And if we think about um, the average life expectancy of 80 years and um, we had something that had a disability weight, an illness that had a disability weight of 0.25 and a person lived with that illness for 40 years, they contracted it when they were 10. So that might be something like an amputation of a limb. Um, and there are different disability weights for different conditions. And then they died at age 50, so they lost 30 years of, of healthy life, which um, equals 30. So 30 plus 10 equals 40 dallies. So that's a very simple way of thinking about disability adjusted life years. Obviously, when you're doing this over a population, you wanna make sure you take into account uncertainty as well. So for foodborne diseases, our global estimates were that there was around about 600 million episodes per year and 420,000 deaths with 33 million dallies. As you can see, diarrheal diseases were the, the biggest cause of foodborne illness and that's just because there's around about 2 million episodes of foodborne, uh, 2 billion episodes of foodborne illness each year, uh, of diarrheal disease each year. Not all of that is foodborne, of course, so around about one quarter. And as you can see, chemicals resulted in a very small proportion of the disability adjusted life years, but that is large because there's missing data and it's very difficult attributing illness to chemicals when then they result in multi-causal outcomes. So diarrheal diseases, 18 million dallies, invasive infections, which includes things like um, listeriosis and hepatitis, um, A and E viruses, um, 8 million dallies, and chemicals, 0.9 million 
And just to show you how the, the difference between incidents and dallies when um, you compare across pathogens, and this is one of the benefits of do, using different metrics. So for something like um, invasive salmonella, where there's an estimate of around about 285,000 foodborne cases occurring each year, so this is causing bacteremia or meningitis or encephalitis. Um, compare that to Giardia, where there's 28 million cases each year. Um, and if we look at this same chart with Dallies now, we can see that Giardia is one of, is the second lowest ranked according to Dallies, causing only 26,000 Dallies because the illness is very short lived and does not really cause any appreciable mortality. Um, but if we compare that to some invasive salmonella infections, and this is not including typhoid, um, you can see that it's one of the higher ranked pathogens by Dallies. So one, almost 1 1.8 million dallies um, in a given year, which just highlights the importance of taking into account severity. In terms of regional disparity, clear, a clear um, difference by level of development and Africa and Southeast Asian region and, and Eastern Mediterranean region have the highest burden of foodborne illness. It's also important to recognise when we're doing this on a global scale that there are focal problems as well. And this is just an example of that where we see um, trematode infection um, dallies and you can see that it's largely in Southeast Asia due to consumption of raw freshwater fish. Um, and so while particular pathogens might be a problem in certain countries, not going to be um, a problem necessarily in all countries. I think importantly, the burden was not shared equally. Um, children under five are, it, it make up around about 9% of the world population, but they experience 38% of foodborne illnesses, 30% of foodborne deaths, and 40% of foodborne deaths. Similarly, in low and middle income countries, 41% of the world's population, 53% of foodborne illnesses, 75% of foodborne deaths, and 72% of foodborne deaths. So clear um, disparities. So we're going to move on to public health surveillance for foodborne disease. And this is a quote which I, I really love by David Satcher, who was a Surgeon General in the US. It's, in public health, we can't do anything without surveillance. That's where public health begins. And it really points out that public health surveillance is the cornerstone of, of good public health. So in terms of foodborne disease surveillance, the definition is ongoing systematic collection, analysis and interpretation of data about foodborne diseases to inform implementation and evaluation of disease prevention and dissemination of data to those who need to know to prevent and control disease. Obviously, the key thing you should take away from surveillance is that it's about data for action. The aims for foodborne disease more specifically is to identify clusters and outbreaks of disease, to describe the epidemiology of foodborne diseases, to monitor interventions through disease trends. And foodborne illness is an area where we can have wholesale interventions in the food supply chain. A good example being pasteurisation of milk, after which we, fat, we saw major changes in, in disease in, in society. There are many different types of surveillance, um, largely broken up into event-based and indicator. So event-based, we're really looking for outbreak, outbreaks, epidemic prone pathogens. So a couple of examples of that from foodborne pathogens might be norovirus, chemical poisonings, or ciguatera, which is a fish um, borne illness um, related to toxins that are bioaccumulated. Indicator-based surveillance, which is really more about detecting individual cases, and that um, includes syndromic surveillance, case clusters, and examples of that would be watery diarrhoea or dysentery in low and middle income countries. And laboratory confirmed, which picks up widely distributed outbreaks, and that is really um, what we largely concentrate on in high income countries like Australia. So. We, here we're looking for, for infections with organisms such as Salmonella, Shigella, Listeria. 
It's also important to understand the, the pathway of exposure through to disease, through to reporting for surveillance. And I think this is a key feature of any surveillance system is that it's important to understand how the data actually got into the surveillance data set. Um, and just as an example, for something like salmonella, which is an outbreak prone infection, we have someone who's eat, eaten a, a bad piece of food, maybe a hot dog, and the incubation period for salmonella is between zero to three days, and they might be starting to feel ill. It might take them a further one to five days to visit a doctor. That depends very much on their symptom profile and how severe the illness is. At that point, they may submit a specimen within the next two days, and the doctor may report to the health department, although it's unlikely without a laboratory confirmed diagnosis. Once the laboratory isolates salmonella, um, they will report that to the health department, and they will forward on a culture to a reference laboratory, and it's five reference laboratories in Australia that serotype salmonella. Um, the, the jurisdictions which don't have a serotyping laboratory, as you can imagine, are the smaller ones. So Northern Territory, ACT, and Tasmania. Those reference laboratories will then serotype it and potentially conduct other tests like multi-locus variable tandem repeat analysis test or MLVA or whole genome sequencing. So that might take a further one to seven days and that will be reported to the health department who will then, if they've got a collection of cases that are of the same strain type, might initiate an outbreak investigation. But you can see from this complicated diagram that it really can take anywhere from seven to 21 days for a case to be reported to a health department, making it very difficult to determine what they ate in their incubation period when you actually contact them to do hypothesis generating interviews. Another phenomenon that's currently happening at the moment is the, the introduction of culture independent diagnostic testing, which is rapid PCR tests in pathology laboratories. This has been happening for a number of years, uh, for the last couple of decades, for, for urinary tract infections and respiratory tract infections. Um, but it's only been occurring in the last five years for enteric infections. Um, and what it does mean is that you don't get a culture and you can't then go on to type organisms. And this just shows you the chart for the number of salmonella notifications in the National Notified Disease Surveillance System that have no, surveillance, no salmonella serotype recorded. And you can see that it's um, dramatically increased after 2013 when um, culture independent diagnostic testing was introduced, which is a concern for detection of outbreaks at both the jurisdictional level, but also at the national level. And it really stops us using incredibly helpful tools like whole genome sequencing. Um, whole genome sequencing is, um, has been increasing in its use in these reference laboratories around the country, so state-based reference laboratories. And you can see here, by this is different foodborne pathogens that are under common surveillance in Australia. And you can see how useful whole genome sequencing is to detect outbreaks and also to attribute sources. So by that we mean attributing back to what was the ultimate source in the community if we, if we were to have isolates from food and animals, how useful would it be to attribute sources? And you can see here that for organisms like um, Campylobacter, it's not really that useful for in the outbreak investigation, but it's incredibly useful for Listeria, Hepatitis A, Salmonella. Um, organisms like norovirus, where there's a, it's highly infectious, there's a high degree of person-to-person -person transmission, and whole genome sequencing is less useful for both outbreak investigation and source attribution. That said, norovirus can be a very potent cause of foodborne illness where you get certain vehicles that are contaminated. So in terms of international efforts to um, put, to drive whole genome sequencing as the, the strain characterization of choice, in Australia we have a genomics network. In the USA we have 
PulseNet, which is run out of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. And they're basically testing all listeria prospectively, which is something we do here in Australia. It's one of the few organisms that all um, infections have whole genome sequencing conducted. And they're currently about to turn on other organisms like Salmonella, Shigella, Yersinia, um, Shiga toxin producing E. coli. The USA also has Genome Track, which is an open source database run by the FDA that um, receives sequences from animals, foods, all sorts of different types, and it has been very effective at detecting outbreaks in the US and internationally. In European countries, it's highly variable. Most sequence during outbreaks, um, but there have been big research consortia that have been looking at um, how to actually harmonise whole genome sequencing across countries and improve multi-country investigation. Because as you can imagine, food travels and so do the pathogens on them. So we, we commonly see multi-country outbreaks occurring. In the United Kingdom, is probably the most advanced with regards to whole genome sequencing. It's been a dramatic change um, where they have turned on whole genome sequencing of all salmonella. And this is a, a um, diagram illustrating um, sequences for, um, of salmonella showing strains for a single year in, the, in um, Public Health England. And you can imagine it's changed the nature of interpretation and, and investigation because you now need a new class of person to help you understand it, which is a bioinformatician. And you almost need an interpreter sometimes to go between the bioinformatician and the public health specialist. So quite complicated, and but it is very much worth understanding. And you can see they've been colour coded by the serotype here. And, and um, yeah, it's, it leads to complex data visualisation. What is important for foodborne diseases is to integrate surveillance data. And by that I mean typing animals, food and human agents. It's useful for source attribution, but it's currently not done routinely in Australia. There are many isolates in sequence databases and you can access them public, you know, in public domain databases. So there's around about four and a half thousand Campylobacter strains in NCBI, an international um, sequence database. The, the benefits are that it would, may allow us to, to intervene before there's a really large problem. And it allows us to be much more specific in targeting food industries where there's a need to actually work. And it can minimise industry-wide impacts. We can also capture additional information from whole genome sequencing, um, such as antimicrobial resistance profiles. So the genotypic profile of a pathogen often strongly mirrors its phenotypic response to antibiotics. There are, so the key surveillance challenges for foodborne disease, and it's important to recognise foodborne disease is not a vertical program in Australia. It's part of state-based surveillance of infections. Um, but there are challenges and they particularly surround this idea of forwarding on cultures to reference laboratories who then conduct specialised tests. And they are financial costs, poor reporting of cases, as you can imagine, there's a lot of undercount with surveillance of foodborne infections. For every case reported to surveillance for salmonella, we estimate there's around about between sort of seven to eight cases occurring in the community. There are rapid microbiological changes disrupting the system. And the practicalities of whole genome sequencing make it challenging as well. So storing the data and the management of that is complex, the analysis is not something that just anybody can do without training, and visualisation has changed. We're no longer doing epi curves, but we're doing minimum spanning trees and a whole lot of other newer types of visualisations. And then, as I mentioned, harmonising the surveillance approach across jurisdictions and amongst sectors. So we do find that um, there will be different standards of interpretation across the country in different laboratories, which may, makes for difficulties when we're trying to do multi-state investigations.
And then sharing sensitive data is a big issue. We recently had an outbreak of um, listeria associated with rock melons in Australia. And when the strain was put up onto a public domain data set, a third party country, Singapore, said, that's interesting, we've got a case. And sure enough, it was um, a, a very closely related strain to the listeria and that was um, causing the outbreak in Australia, which meant that our exports of rock melons um, was, was interrupted and also the consumption of rock melons in Australia in total was actually disrupted as well. So surveillance here can have big impacts on trade and public confidence. So we're gonna move on to outbreak investigation. This is a picture of a packet of peanuts um, from an investigation we did in about 2001. Um, I was working for Oz Food Net, which is a national network of um, foodborne disease surveillance that operates out of state and territory health departments and the Commonwealth Health Department. This packet of peanuts was contaminated with Salmonella Stanley, um, a rare strain, and we had about 50 cases across the country. It was the, one of the first multi-jurisdictional salmonella outbreak investigations we did as a team. And what was strange about it is that every, every state had five or six infections, but not enough to investigate. But when you put them all together, sure enough, you had an outbreak. Here we had, um, we did the trace back and, and, an, and a, the Victorian cases, one of them remembered eating peanuts at a friend's house. He was, and there was a high proportion of people who were of Asian um, background. And um, so they, so Agnes Tan from the Microbiological Diagnostic Unit Laboratory in Melbourne went and tested these peanuts and sure enough, she isolated the strain of Salmonella Stanley. When we let out, when we put this on ProMed, a public domain list server and told them about this outbreak, we started getting reports back from other countries, including Canada and the UK, that they also had similar outbreaks and had no idea what was causing it. And lo and behold, the peanuts were the cause there as well. And so it led to a multi-country recall of these products. It was a trial product. Only a thousand packets were sent to the country, to Australia. And um, I don't know that it um, was a successful product launch. Anyway, so the steps of investigating an outbreak, and this is a little different. You will, if you look in the literature or in books, you'll find that there is anywhere between eight to 12 steps of investigating an outbreak. I tend to like the field epidemiology um, training manual from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and it has 10. What I'm gonna show you here is um, the steps that, that, that are used by the Food and Waterborne Disease um, division at CDC. They have a subtly different one and it reflects the nature of investigating cases of foodborne illnesses. They're reported to a state or territory health department. So basically an outbreak is detected and that might be a cluster of cases of, that, are, that do not know each other. They might have the same salmonella strain or the same strain of E. coli or it might be a, a cohort of people who know each other and they've all been afflicted with some enteric illness. So this represents potential possible outbreak. So then we want to find further cases. So we're gonna find further cases in an outbreak. The next step for us, once we've started to identify further cases, we might do this through active surveillance or we might go through a guest list at a, at a wedding or something, is to generate hypotheses. So we might interview you know, several cases and, and generate hypotheses. At that time, it's important for us to collect stool specimens or other relevant clinical samples that might give us a clue to etiology. We then test those hypotheses through analytic studies and laboratory testing. So we might do, we would do complementary analyses. We might do a case control study, or we might do a cohort study. They're the two epidemiological studies of choice and we would also try and collect samples for testing in a lab. Mm -hmm. We also would be liaising with our food safety partners to do trace back of foods that we've identified that are common as well. And then hopefully solve that 
so that and identify the exact point of contamination because if we don't solve it it may come back and occur again later in the year or at some other at some other time we then want to control the outbreak through recall facility improvements and industry collaboration and and the emphasis there is on collaboration it's not we don't it's not meant to be a punitive environment we find that the court of public opinion does enough damage without that and then to decide that the outbreak is over sometimes that isn't always clear and the outbreaks can sometimes be very protracted and long we get outbreaks that will last over a year where we have not discovered what the food vehicle is the ideal is to get in early and intervene and try and stop future cases occurring so if we if we're not finding associations we might need to go back to the drawing board and try and redevelop our hypotheses and that does occasionally happen in terms of who detects outbreaks so we might get people reporting mass illness, so business owner or someone who's attended an event and a lot of people have come down with illness. Facility managers, so an aged care facility. Alert clinicians are a critical point of identifying unusual clustering of illness. Media, we might read it about it in the newspaper or on Facebook or on Twitter. Specific laboratory diagnoses, again, through surveillance of common strains, it's is a critically important source of outbreak information. And then public health surveillance of listeria, salmonella, and other outbreak prone pathogens. In terms of finding cases, um, we might, it's typical of outbreaks as we're often finding cases as once we've been alerted, we have to go through guest lists or try and identify other cases because the more cases we can identify, the more chance we've got of finding cause. We would develop a case definition that might be multi-stage or change during the nature of the investigation. Um, and we would also try and identify and evaluate who's been exposed to whatever contaminated food. In Australia, they, AusFoodNet tends to use a standardised questionnaire um, in the hypothesis generating phase. So all cases of salmonella will often be interviewed with the same standard hypothesis generating questionnaire or have a laundry list of questions at the end asking have you eaten various types of food that have been involved in previous outbreaks and after a new outbreak they will add more um, ex potential exposures on there. We often in the early phases of an outbreak will generate symptom profiles that we've determined from five to ten interviews right at the beginning and this is when we're collecting specimens from people to try and identify what the cause was. Um, it can give us etiological clues um, that help us think through what might be potential vehicles or the population affected and the seasonality. They can all sort of be indicators. The reason we develop symptom profiles is because it directs our investigation, helps us form a case definition, helps us know what clinical um, samples to collect and also helps us with early intervention and control activities. And it's important to realise that if a patient presents to a doctor in a surgery, they're not going to be able to work out what the etiology is based on their presentation for, for an enteric infection because there are many different agents that cause similar looking illnesses. But where we have multiple people presenting in an outbreak setting, there may be features that give away that it's more likely to be a certain type of pathogen. So, um, why well, guess the bug, the syndrome, we can do that through syndromes. So, if we look here, so if we have a, a whole bunch of people presenting with more than 50% vomiting, 24 to 48 hour incubation period, less than three days duration of illness, we would be thinking, viral infection and particularly norovirus which has a classic 36 hour incubation period um, and can be predominantly vomiting if it was something like very short incubation period so people ate a meal and then got sick within hours we're thinking a toxin like a preformed toxin um, and which is generally a very short-lived illness so it might be something like clostridium perfringens bacillus cereus or staph aureus 
all of which produce toxins in different ways. So they manifest subtly differently, but um, they're all short incubation period. And then if we've got a more severe illness, like um, you know, with a longer incubation period and longer duration, um, with higher proportion of people reporting fever, we might be thinking of bacterial enteritis like Salmonella, Campylobacter, Shigella. So if we have an idea about this, it's always better to be able to tell the laboratory, please make sure you test for X, Y, or Z. And so if we have this, this idea about what might be the cause, we can guide the laboratory. So for viral pathogens, we might be asking for a PCR. For toxins, we obviously need a specialised test which isn't included in the normal testing regime of pathology laboratories. And then for bacteria, it's routine culture or PCR. And this can help us guide control. So with something like norovirus, we're clearly going to identify sick food handlers or food vehicles that are particularly prone to norovirus contamination. We might be looking at um, controlling the way that they're preparing food if it's toxins, because that is usually an indicator of poor food handling. So having food at the wrong temperature for too long and not proper periods of cooling. For bacterial enteritis, it might be either contamination through cross um, contamination in the kitchen environment, or it might actually be an ingredient or something that's been contaminated further up the chain, maybe on the farm or in the processing environment. So it's very important to identify those the causes of those outbreaks. It's important to recognise that when we're thinking about testing for these pathogens that um, if you, you're interested in getting clinical specimens that you would be sending them off to a reference laboratory of your choosing, not letting them go to their GP and sending it through the pathology system and you hoping to track down the specimens at some later point. You, you need to be collecting them yourselves and making sure that they're going to the place where you want them to being tested in the way that you want them to. Someone once described them to me as your children and you need to know who's looking after them at all times. So investigation challenges, obviously I mentioned before this time frame is very challenging. So, you know, we, we're really talking about for most infections that have come through routine laboratory based surveillance of between one to seven days to be able to interview them and may, you know, maybe two to three weeks up bef the, the time period that we want to know about, and that's really tricky. This just shows a chart of salmonella infections in Australia, and you can see here that we've had a, a big increase, and this relates to a big increase of egg-associated outbreaks of salmonella typhimum in 2010. Um, and egg-associated outbreaks have really taken off over the last a um, couple of decades, and this is just between data from between 2000 and 2011, and it's gone up um, even more. So egg-associated outbreaks is responsible for around about 50% of all salmonella outbreaks. And you can see there's anywhere to 50 to 60 in a given year. At the moment, we have an incursion of a new um, salmonella into Australia through egg-laying flocks, and it is salmonella enteritidis. So that is a different serotype than we've had in egg laying flocks in the past. It's been a big problem in North America and Europe because it causes trans ovarian infection in chickens. So it actually goes through the oviduct into the internal contents of the egg. And so the Australian um, uh, layer industry is very worried about this pathogen occurring in Australia. And there have been outbreaks in New South Wales and Victoria. And hopefully it won't get established because it has the potential to increase the number of salmonella infections. And it is also slightly more invasive than salmonella type Miriam as well. So you get more cases resulting in bacteremia. This is an outbreak of Campylobacter and here's an epidemic curve. You can see um, clinical cases and con laboratory confirmed cases. This occurred in Canberra and it was investigated by ACT Health and it was um, following a function or a meal at a university college very near where I'm sitting. 
Um, and the reason I'm showing you is just to show how sometimes whole genome sequencing can help us and sometimes it can actually not help us. And this is the example where they got specimens from cases and you can see that this is a phylogenetic tree, a very simplified one, and it's only showing the reference there um, and showing seven cases. And you can see there's quite a big difference between cases. So 30 single nucleotide polymorphisms. So that's essentially 30 base pairs different um, to those other cases down the bottom. But what is also interesting is you can see that there's two food samples and this is foods that were recovered from the meal. The meal included a chicken liver parfait, which was an undercooked chicken liver pate kind of thing, um, which was a fad, has been a fad in the restaurant industry and um, serve it with blood running out of it. And you can see here that um, these food samples, while it wasn't necessarily the same one that was eaten by these, this um, group of students who got infected, you can see that there's a huge difference here. So 3000 single nucleotide polymorphisms. And that represent, you'd, you'd say that that's not the same, but because they're part of their, from the liver, maybe there's a large diversity of Campylobacter here. So this one doesn't actually really help us, but in the main, whole genome sequencing helps us a lot. And it, this may still shine a light onto the epidemiology of Campylobacter infections. Um, this is the, probably the first example, this is an epidemic curve um, of Salmonella enteritidis outbreak investigation that occurred in Europe. And you can see here that um, this is occurred in the UK and Spain. And I would say this is probably from Spanish eggs, which keep causing infections in the UK um, with Salmonella enteritidis. And it's one of the first examples of a multi-country investigation using whole genome sequencing. And this is also just showing a minimum spanning tree diagram so again showing you the visualization of this is um you can see the outbreak is right up there in the top left um but there's a huge diversity there of salmonella enteritis just another example of a different type of outbreak and this is an outbreak of outbreaks um, and this relates back to the type of pathogen outbreaks will manifest differently depending on the type of pathogen and their infectious characteristics so in this example, we had um, multiple outbreaks, Western Australia, Northern Territory, and Queensland, and they were all investigated by MAE scholars and AusFoodNet. And um, they had a consistent study design, which was important to make sure that the state and territory investigating teams communicated. And there was coordinated traceback conducted by Food Stamps Australia, New Zealand, the, federal standard setting agency for food, that the outbreak was traced back to individually quick frozen oysters harvested from the same week in the Bay of Hiroshima, very close to each other, not from the same company, but this was um, what we call poor man's oyster meat and it was served at conferences and restaurants as oyster shooters and undercooked. And so people were developing norovirus 36 hours later. So as a result, Australia restricted the import of oysters from Japan and um, Korea so that these individually quick frozen oysters weren't able to be imported. Funnily enough, New Zealand didn't do that. And a couple of years later, they had a big outbreak of norovirus at the Rugby World Cup from these particular types of oysters. WHO has been assisting countries to um, improved surveillance and investigation of outbreaks. They've got a self-assessment tool. Countries can nominate for workshops that are tailored to meet their needs and they've conducted workshops in a range of countries within the region. And here's just a diagram showing that people can categorise themselves at different stages. So I think Australia would be sitting somewhere between category two and three. Um, that said, our system of surveillance and investigation is very robust. We just, at the moment, are lacking coordinated national surveillance where we can 
see the results of our whole genome sequencing. But other than that, our systems are excellent. So I think the key things for investigating foodborne disease control, what I would emphasise from a public health practitioner's perspective, is to investigate outbreaks rapidly. We can't wait until tomorrow, we have to do them today. We need to characterise the key outbreak agents. Um, we should be summarising all of our outbreak investigations in the form of outbreak surveillance or publishing them because they add to the prevention effort. Even if it's an outbreak that's got, you know, might be a relatively small, it may add up to highlighting the key causes of foodborne contamination that we can intervene at a system level. I think always think one level up. If you're working in a public health unit or a state or territory health department and you have an outbreak and you think maybe this outbreak might be happening somewhere else, it probably is. And that's certainly what we have seen many, many times that one public health unit's investigating an outbreak and lo and behold, the neighbouring one's investigating something very similar and they're related. So I think the upshot of all of this is to communicate about um, your investigations. I think it's really important to improve collaboration across sectors, epidemiology, food safety and agriculture. This can be really difficult because they have different aims. The epidemiologist wants to understand what is the cause. The food safety person wants to make sure the food supply is safe. The person in agriculture may want to make sure that there's market access for exported products. So there's different tensions there and it can be very challenging but it's very necessary. This is a picture of bon soy soy milk and it was linked to hypothyroidism in patients and it was detected by a very alert endocrinology clinic and published in the Medical Journal of Australia. So lots of people who were having healthy soy lattes were getting hypothyroidism and um, a very you know, difficult to detect outbreak and um, um, yeah, but it just shows that the alert clinician is a very important piece of the puzzle. Just a few reflections. Who gets sick? Well, I think lots of people, you know, no one is immune from foodborne illness, from the, the very rich to the very poor. Those who are poor um, obviously have a higher burden of illness and that is due to unsafe food supplies. This is a picture of Jenny Musto, who is an epidemiologist in New South Wales Health and now works for WHO. And she's pictured here in um, the Northern Pacific um, and they were investigating an outbreak of um, poisoning of unknown origin in a village where around about 10 people had died after eating hawksbill turtles. When they got there, there was a juvenile hawksbill that was still tied up and ready to be eaten. And this is Jenny letting it go. But it just goes to show that foodborne illness can be very serious and um, it, it affects everybody. What makes them sick? These are some of the food vehicles that you might encounter across um, the, you know, the investigating spectrum, everything from barn me through to baby corn. Uh, it's, it's an amazing array of foods that become contaminated. At the moment, there's been huge issues in the US about contaminated bake, flour used for baking and it's been contaminated with E. coli and salmonella. And so people are eating it raw in cookie dough and other things and it's causing infections. So it, it never ceases to amaze me what does actually come up as a cause of enteric infections. Who investigates? Well, they're usually teams. It's not um, really individuals per se, it's gonna be teams and they may be teams of teams people working in multiple state health departments, federal health departments, food safety agencies, departments of agriculture. And I think it's really important to, re to recognise that because it really shapes the way you communicate and work together. And, um, you know, sometimes you can have teleconference calls and there might be anywhere from 50 to 100 people on them around the country. So it's a very important reflection. And I, I think um, often the public health position plays a really important role here because they're usually leading teams of people investigating locally, um, but not always. It can be an epidemiologist or a public health nurse. Someone who's got experience in the area is obviously best placed to do that. 
five lessons. Foodborne disease spreads, it, it doesn't stay localised and wherever food goes, it will take pathogens and contaminants with it. I think adopt new technology where there's a huge disruptive influences at the moment. We can use much better tools for data collection and much better tools for laboratory testing. Using whole genome sequencing is like putting on corrective lenses, you can see clearly. We need to harmonise our methods, both of investigation and our testing and other procedures, and that just makes for teams working together better. And then communicate, communicate, communicate. I can't emphasise that strongly enough. And join forces, particularly across agency if possible, and always be thinking, um, where does this pathogen or contaminant originate from? So in summary, foodborne disease does have a high disease burden. Um, there are many surveillance challenges, including the time it takes for agents to be characterised and laboratory testing to occur. Robust investigation is vital. Communicating is critical and so is food safety ultimately. So. Um, yeah, I think just end um, by saying thanks very much. Happy to take some questions. Thanks, Martin. If you want to pop open your Q and A tab, yeah, we'll do. You have a few questions there. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. just answer some of those so so if you want to read out the question yeah. and answer it live so one of the questions was what chemicals were you referring to in the initial slides and I'm actually I'm not exactly sure I'm going to come back to you on that because I was actually involved in the enteric one I can tell you more of the enterics but I might actually come back to that um, and I will definitely provide information. And what I'll also do is provide the reference. It was published in PLOS Medicine. Um, yeah, so me, uh, someone's asked, would you be able to provide some examples of when a case control um, versus a cohort study is used in practice for foodborne disease outbreaks? And this is a relatively easy answer. I, I think for a, you always really want to be doing a cohort study if you possibly can. Um, the, the time when you would do that is when you can identify who the cohort is. So if you have a busload of tourists or people have been to a wedding, you can do a cohort study on those and you can look at the risks of developing illness if people have eaten different foods. That's the ideal situation because it's much easier communicating risk to the public and um, they're much easier to conduct. If you have to do a case control study, it's usually because you can't identify what the cohort is. So notifiable diseases often require you to do a case control study because they seem to come out of the woodwork. You know, if you're in the Victorian Health Department and you're getting cases of salmonella being notified, they might be coming from, you know, Altona, from Bendigo, and they're not, they're, there's no apparent connection. They're connected because they've got the same pathogen in if infecting them and here is where you would do a case control study and that would mean you would select people into your study based on their disease status so whether they've got disease or not and that's the key way you can tell a case control and a cohort study apart is how did you select people into your study if you selected them based on their exposure it's a cohort study if you selected them based on their disease status it's a case control study. So I hope that that answers that question. I've got another question here. What was the agent implicated in the link between bond soy and hypothyroidism? That's an excellent question. And it was actually kombu. It was kombu, which is a type of kelp. And it's dried, obviously, and um, used a lot in Japanese and Korean cooking. And in this instance, it was, and iodine naturally occurs in 
um, in kombu, but some it can be much higher than others. And this was a particular type of kombu that had been produced, I think, in China. Um, I can also provide the link to the MJA article if people are interested as well. Um, chemical, so I've got a question here from New South Wales Health on thanks, what are chemical causes of foodborne disease? Well, there's a range of toxins and obviously anything that um, is going to, you know, it, it, it's just a means of ingesting toxins, but some of the ones that are typical are things like histamine poisoning. So we can get fish such as tuna, where it's been improperly handled, you can get a buildup of histamines and histidines in the fish flesh that are produced by bacteria. And that results in an allergic type illness, which is easily relieved by antihistamines um, and very short lived, but it can be very serious if, it, if the histamines are present in very high levels. You also get um, illnesses like ciguatera, which is produced by a toxin that is bioaccumulated on coral reefs and, and it's accumulated up the food chain. It's actually a, a toxin produced by um, dinoflagellates <coughs> type of algae. Um, what other types of chemicals? I mean, there's, I think there's a range of others as well, but they're the main ones that we think of. Um, and obviously there are other toxins that, that result in, in foodborne disease as well. I think I've answered the next one, which was how did bond soy milk cause hypothyroidism? I hope that's made it clearer. And I've got another one here from New South Wales Health, which is what are the top five foods we should avoid? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, I've got five foods I don't eat very much and they would be um, alfalfa sprouts. I really don't like them because they're actually stock feed and there's been lots of big outbreaks. I don't really eat frozen berries because we've seen outbreaks of uh, hepatitis A and norovirus. And I also, you know, just think they're pretty tasteless anyway. Um, I don't eat barn me. I really love barn me and I love Vietnamese food. I cook it probably once every couple of weeks. But barn me has caused really big outbreaks. They tend to use raw egg butter in the rolls. Um, which is a, just a mayonnaise made out of raw eggs. And they also have pate, which is often undercooked, a liver pate. Um, so it's caused very big outbreaks. That said, food safety agencies in Australia have gone to great lengths to try and make sure they're safe. Um, and oysters from the wrong place, I don't really like. I don't like oysters if they've been um, from, you know, somewhere where it's really this obvious sewage contamination and raw milk which you don't really get exposed to anyway. So that's not really helpful. Probably the one which causes the most illnesses in Australia is um, undercooked chicken when cross-contaminated um, because they carry Campylobacter bacteria and um, that has the potential to cause Campylobacteriosis. Um, is there, uh, the next question I've got, is there a systematic approach of any sort of identifying cross-jurisdictional outbreaks or less systematic? There, there is actually surveillance for cross-jurisdictional outbreak investigations and AusFoodNet, the network I mentioned earlier on, there are AusFoodNet epidemiologists in every state territory health department and a coordinating epidemiologist within the central federal health department. Each fortnight they would send around a bulletin saying what they're investigating, how many cases of different infections they're following up. And that leads to lots of identification across jurisdictional outbreaks. But probably more importantly is looking at our data nationally would be the best thing. And at the moment we are a bit behind the times with whole genome sequencing because we're only really comparing sequence data when there is an outbreak. But the ideal situation is that we should be looking for emergence of new strains on a real-time basis using whole genome sequencing. So that would rely on all the laboratories sharing their data in real time. And that's not currently occurring, although there's a lot of moves afoot to make that happen. Um, 
Yes, so I've got another question here, just wanting to understand who are the controls in a case control study and how do you select them? Well, this is a, a difficult question. Controls are people who are similar to the cases, but they are not ill. So you can really use a variety of different sources. You can select them from the same clinic that the case presented to. You can select them from randomly from the community. So, you know, through we used to use random digit dial when people had landlines and or you could use next digit dial is get their mobile phone number and dial the next person. Um, then that, you know, they're using a sequential addition of a digit. Um, but what a lot of health departments have been doing in recent years is actually using other diseased persons, but not with the disease in question. So if you are interviewing cases of Campylobacter infection, for instance, in a case control study, you might say, well, we're going to interview cases who people who've had influenza in the last year because you've got their contact details. You can randomly select from people who've had influenza and ring them up and ask them a similar questionnaire, ask them about food exposures, and then you can compare exposures in people who are diseased, the cases, with those in the controls, those who don't have illness. So hopefully that has answered that question. Um, I think that's probably all the questions I've got. Um, but I will make sure I send a link to the publication on the global foodborne disease burden because I don't remember the exact chemicals. Um, I didn't pay attention to that part. But as you can see, it, it was very difficult because I think foodborne chemicals is a huge issue, particularly um, things like lead and dioxins and other chemicals. But they're much more difficult to estimate their effect. Um, in, from an epidemiological perspective. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, Terence. Thank you for such a wonderful presentation. I believe that brings us to the end. Okay, thanks. I'm very happy for people to contact me after this as well if they've got further questions. Not a problem. I'll distribute your email in the chat. So if anyone is after Professor Professor's email, um, please find it in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much.